Hello, this is Eileen Serlin. I'm interviewing Tom Greening. We are here at APA in Toronto, Canada, August 8th, 2015. And it started this morning, we had a meeting of the editorial board of JHP. And I saw Tom's face registering disbelief as they were reading out the numbers and how it's grown over time. We thought it might be a good idea to document some of the history of the beginning of the journal, how it's grown, and how it looks to Tom today as it approaches its nearly 60th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And Tom is about to start with, he just happened to be at the right place at the right time, how he got involved. Uh, I graduated from Yale in 1952, went to Vienna for a year and got a little bit of exposure to existential psychology, not much there. Uh, I was the Korean War, I didn't want to go into the military, so I went back to Michigan University, University of Michigan, to get my PhD. Uh, not much existential psychology there, but and then I needed a job. Uh, and uh, I looked at several places, including UCLA, but there, there was a small group practice of psychotherapy in West LA. Uh, run by somebody no one had ever heard of, Jim Bugenthal. Mm -hmm. But they were looking for a young staff psychologist. So I thought, well, I'll pay my airfare, I'll go to, out to California and talk to them. But I'm really somewhat more interested in some other possibilities. Um, so I went out there and interviewed, and uh, they offered me a position as a sort of junior associate in their group practice. Well, uh, okay, it was a job, and I was doing psychotherapy, which is what I wanted to do. Existential therapy didn't exist at that point, really. Uh, Carl Rogers had come on the scene with person-centered therapy. That was of interest. But Jim Bugenthal had been trained in learning theory uh, psychotherapy, I think by George Kelly at uh, I forget, Ohio State, probably. Uh, so it was a job. It was doing psychotherapy. But I had been influenced by French existential literature and by my year in Vienna uh, to think a little bit more, not much more, but a little bit more philosophically about psychotherapy and existence and meaning and so forth. Well, by chance, 1958, the year I took the job, was the same year that Rollo, Rollo May published um, Existence. And Jim Fugenthal was tuned in enough to know that that was important. I didn't know about that. I don't think I even knew who, much who Rollo May was. Uh, but it, that sort of started it. Jim got interested and I had a natural inclination and a little bit of background uh, in that direction. And so we uh, continued in practice together. I'm still uh, in the same office. I've been in 57 years. Do you know anybody who has been in the, that's either a tribute to my dogged commitment to psychotherapy and existential humanistic therapy, or just to my lack of ambition and uh, uh, whatever else it takes to do something else. Um, but it turned out to be a great home base. Even after Jim Bugenthal left and went north, uh, we still uh, continued a very strong existential practice there. Okay, so then um, 1963 or something like that, um, they needed a new editor for the journal. Abe Maslow and Tony Sudich had founded the Journal of Humanistic Psychology based on Abe's mailing list for he used to send his papers out. They thought, well, why keep sending papers through the U.S. mail? Why don't we make a journal out of it? Brandeis um, con uh, contributed money to get that started. This has all been written up somewhere, I think, in an article in the journal, the history uh, of it. Um, so they had this journal going. Uh, and I became editor, which consisted of being handed two or three second-rate papers that they had in the file. Now I'm supposed to do a journal, but somehow I got papers. I don't know how we solicited, got some good papers. The journal was still being set by hard, tape, hard type, back by Heffernan Press, back in New England, all these changes, techno intellectual changes, even spiritual changes, but also mundane technological changes to produce a journal. Um, now, I mean, I was just astonished this morning. I, no, I never dreamed of all the electronic uh, uh, vigor that uh, now supports a journal, the ease with which articles can be obtained and, and sent to people uh, and archived and so forth. It's, it's really heartening and, and people all over the world. Yeah, you, know, you, can, you can get the journal um, 
easily overseas. I'll jump around a little bit. Um, one day, some years later, I got in the mail from China uh, a, a manuscript uh, by a Chinese psychologist on humanistic psychology, that seems strange, uh, uh, written in English, fortunately, since I don't know Chinese, but it was on large sheets of brown paper, which is very awkward. I don't know what sort of typewriter they had over there to produce that, mm -hmm. but it was a good article. I was impressed to read it, it's like humanistic psychology in China, what they were doing. And so, uh, I had it photo reduced to eight and a half by 11. I edited it with my trusty red pen uh, long before the days of uh, track changes and electronic editing uh, and sent it back, back and forth. And then we, we published, that was the first article by someone from China in the journal. And that nowadays there's more contact there, but it was remarkable uh, to, to find out that there was someone there. And this, he reported to me that Abe Maslow's books sold more copies in China than they did in the <laughs> United States. I thought that was bizarre, too. So part of it is being in this seat or this window of humanistic psychology and seeing these changes evolving and happening that, that I, uh, you know, and Jim Bujanel and I and Abe Maslow and others, we made, we instituted some of them, but they kind of came out of the ground. I mean, some guy in China reading and writing articles and things. Uh, it just it had a, uh, a natural uh, synergic uprising. Somehow the time was ripe, um, and and then it's continued to this day, which amazes me. I keep thinking, well, it's it's nice we have this journal and it's leveled off, and we have three or four thousand subscribers, but it keeps going and uh, blossoming and uh, getting good articles and so forth. And now it's so easily available around the world. In the old days, of course, it was hard copy only. Uh, I mentioned earlier today to somebody that I, after the Cold War was over, I was delighted to learn from a Czechoslovakian sub, uh, subscriber, I don't know if he was a subscriber, that during the, uh, the whole Russian occupation and, and the Cold War, that the journal had circulated uh, very agilely in the underground in Czechoslovakia and, and elsewhere. Uh, so it was nice to know that sometimes you're having an influence far beyond what you think you're having. Uh, even like Kirk Schneider, who's now such a great contributor to existential humanistic psychology, I remember getting a paper from him. Uh, it was kind of badly typed. Uh, from He was back east somewhere. I didn't, I'd never heard of Kirk Schneider. Why is he sending this paper? Or who is this guy? Was it any good? Needed some editing and some work and so forth, but it was a good paper. Uh, so I, I published it, little knowing that he would be the guy who, years later, would uh, succeed me as uh, editor of the journal. So there's a lot of these little side stories that uh, are, are fun to reminisce about. Um, so then, uh, how to, uh, the, way, and the way I became editor, I think I mentioned, is that Abe and Tony wanted to, f they founded the transpersonal psychology. They were they were less interested in the humanistic psychology, human potential movement. Uh, they were more interested in the transpersonal side, which is nice, and they wanted to have their own journal. So they had sort of turned the journal over to Miles Vitch, and then he didn't want to do it forever. He did it for a year or two, and then somehow they reached out and selected me out of various people to edit the journal. And again, I think, as I said, never my never realizing that it would go and go and go. I keep doing it year after year after year. I, on my bookshelf, I have this huge, long stretch of journals there. And then the time came to, to stop and turn it over to Kirk, and now he's turning it over to Sean Rubin. How did you know it was ta time? Well, it was just, how do you feel now not editing it? Well, it was, a, it was hard to let go of it. I think mm -hmm. I just was tired. I was doing it long enough. I wanted to do more of my own writing maybe uh, yeah enough is enough it, mm -hmm. it's, it's like it's like that old thing about Chinese water torture you know where it keeps dripping and the manuscripts keep coming <laughs> the deadlines keep coming in the beginning it was only twice a year and then and then we got very ambitious and we had enough manuscripts we turned it into a quarterly we thought oh that's a big deal now it's a quarterly and I just learned today they're going to come out now with six issues a year incredible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, at one point, humanistic psychology was not part of the mainstream of psychology, of course, but then Division 32 was founded as a humanistic psychology division. Thought, well, that's nice. Uh, 
kind of some humanistic psychology within APA. But then they decided to start their own journal. And I felt a little bit uh, undercut or betrayed, like we already have a journal. Support the journal we've got. It's hard enough to keep that journal going. Why are you starting another journal? We're going to compete with each other, and it's going to weaken both journals. But it didn't. It turned out to be OK. Although for some years, Scott Churchill and I tried very hard to merge the two journals. We really wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. But the Division 32 board and members didn't want to do it because they would have had to pay I think $4 extra a year in order to get GHP because Sage by then was publishing it. Uh, I'd gone through various printers and publishers and ended up with, with uh, Sage. Um, so we never, we never managed to merge the two journals. And I worried, as I say, that it would make each journal a small, weaker journal if only we could combine them. It turns out it's been okay. Both journals are strong. Uh, do they specialize in different things? Do I, don't, I don't know. I've never so much to do a comparison to mm -hmm. see is there, is there a difference between the journals. Mm -hmm. I don't really, that's a good question. To, uh, I, you might think they might do more academic or research stuff. I might, uh, JHP might be a little more inclined toward personal stories. I don't know if that's true. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do remember like we did a special issue on the Holocaust once. And in that, there were several personal narratives, and I, and I always wanted to have, you know, more instead of research or clinical stuff, also personal narratives. Another okay. another footnote is that I think probably the first article ever published on positive psychology was in the Journal of Humanistic Psychology by Mah what's his name Mahaley Yeah, very good article. I don't know if Seligman ever acknowledged, uh, you know that. Positive psychology got its first exposure. Uh, he won't. There, yeah. Well, we both have our opinions. <laughs> Martin said anything. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm, so, I'm so gratified to see that it, it's, it's valued, it's continued, and it's strong. That it, it turned out to be a financial um, mm -hmm. solid thing. That AHP never. If, you know, first I felt let down that Division 32 didn't embrace it as the journal, as their journal. They started their own, and then I felt let down that the Association for Humanistic Psychology, which was more into experiences and so forth, they weren't not as scholarly. But, so they they didn't really support the journal. It was an optional extra uh, for members. Remembering now that the journal had founded the association, and yet the association did not include the journal in its basic membership, because mm -hmm. uh, they were into, you know, having a good time, mm -hmm. which I certainly enjoyed as well at the con conferences. Um, Tom, looking back on mm -hmm. your life, mm -hmm. would you rate, how would you rate this in terms of what you accomplished, maybe what you hoped to accomplish, maybe what you did mm -hmm. accomplish? That's, 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 a, that's a, a, a deep and um, important, a question I ask myself a lot as I get older, mm -hmm. how old am I now? 84 or something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what's it all about? What have I done? What do I feel good about? So forth. And it, and, and it really does hearten me to know that I, I did it and kept it going for quite a few years. If it had died, then I could still have said, well, I kept it going for 20 years and then life moves on, the profession moves on. But the fact that now it continues and they're going to six issues a year. And it's, and it's stronger than ever, and they get lots of submissions. And, and uh, See, again, I worry that because it's not part of AH, it's not part of APA, it's a SAGE-owned journal, that it would not be as central and valued by psychologists. Well, it turns out it is. Uh, so that was very reassuring uh, that way. And SAGE has been great. I mean, I went through Oh, three or four printer distributors before that, starting with Heffernan Press and then Dharma Press and somebody else, uh, Waverly Press, a big medical publisher, um, and they finally sold it off to Sage, I guess. Um, uh, so it's a it's a sort of an existential journey. Um, you you never quite know when fate or forces are going to to your surprise and dismay push you down and damage you or, hurt or thwart you and when unbeknownst to you they're actually working to support you kind of like i just the analogy came to swimming in the ocean and that next wave 
is it going to crash in such a way as to drive me down into the sand and really make a mess of me? Or am I going to have a nice ride up the beach? Uh, and you can control that to some degree. It's sort of an existential metaphor there. Uh, to what degree can you control that? Choose your wave, ride it well, and accept that it's going to run out at a certain point. Uh, or if you're not good at it, it'll, you, uh, you know, I have a friend who's been paralyzed because he got picked up by a wave and dumped on his head. And so they can, you, never, you never know. What's, what's the next wave that's going to hit humanistic psychology, psychology, and well, psychology in general, this torture thing? God, who would have predicted that? When you first joined APA, if someone had said to you that this organization you're joining, Arlene, is going to be a, a big a, a supporter and implementer of torture, mm -hmm. uh, do you, are you sure you want to join this organization? Mm -hmm. And you would have said, well, it's the major, it is the Association of Psychologists, of course, I want to join it, I don't want it to do that. Um, but that was one reason, of course, the Association for Humanistic Psychology was founded, to have it more humanistic why the journal was founded, because Abe Maslow could not get his papers published in mainstream uh, APA journals. So it's a, it is a sort of a existential metaphoric journey of when, when is it a crisis and when is it an opportunity. It's not a Chinese thing that the character for crisis same, and opportunity is the same character. Yeah. So we should put that on the cover <laughs> of, or have a name tag or something. But you can even go around asking people, at this present point in my life, am I about to fall into a great crisis <laughs> or a great opportunity, or both? And can you help me see the opportunity in the crisis? Otherwise, I'm just going to be Dog, Doggy paddle. Doggy paddle until I crash on my head. You know, you know it's almost time, actually. Is, mm -hmm. is there anything else you want to say, both about what it's meant to you in your life, well, I guess I also, I also want to... for the future for you know, the journal? I, well, I have hopes. I, also, I just want to th uh, uh, express uh, thanks also to people like uh, uh, Sean Rubin and so many others, and people at SAGE and various presidents, uh, and to Jim Butendorf for selecting me, that, and, 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 and to Rollo, to Rollo May also, uh, for being supportive over the years. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Rollo submitting papers to the journal. That was... That was great. You know, I, he could have published them elsewhere, uh, and so I, I do feel a lot of gratitude of, of having been chosen to ride that horse for that part of the time, and then to have other people who will pick it up. And who knows? I mean, you know, ten years from now, when you and I are gone or, not, or out of action, who will be doing it? Some of these people that are up in the suite right now, some people who we've never even heard of. Some people who have not yet heard of humanistic psychology, how do you predict how these things evolve and change and grow? Mm -hmm. We hope that they will keep going. I have a good feeling about that. I feel like humanistic psychology and the journal are here to stay. They may take new different forms and so forth, but uh, they have become uh, a solid part of uh, human culture. It's a little grandiose, but of human culture, certainly of American psychological history and culture. Good point to end on. Okay, thanks, Tom. Huh. Thanks. For